Good evening, Sports Zonians. How's everybody doing out there tonight? I am Mike Agri Laurel. I am your host. This is Sports Zone. Coming to you live like we do each and every week here via the I-95 Sports and Entertainment Radio Network. we got a good show for you tonight. We'll hopefully be joined by both Dave Hastings and Eric Tressler in a matter of moments here. And we got a lot to talk about tonight. We're going to do a little rundown of the action for week six of the NFL football season. We have basketball starting tonight, so we'll probably want to talk a little basketball here tonight. And if Eric does come on, we are going to get his thoughts a kind of post-mortem on the Yankee season. We ended off last week's show with my cousin David coming on, and we talked a little Yankees. As luck would have it, the Yankees uh, wound up losing game four of the uh, AL division series. So we had that last week as, uh, as we were going off the air. And uh, I would like Eric's thoughts on the end of the Yankee season. And I see David is in the chat right now. David, how you doing? I hope you're good. The one thing David said last week, and I'm going to start off the show with something I didn't get a chance to say last week. I know David feels that this season was basically a step back for the Yankees because last year they were one win away from the World Series, and this year they get balanced in the AL Division Series. Well, I don't know if I entirely agree with that. If you look at this in a vacuum, you can take away that it was a step back. But I think you have to look at where the Yankees were at the beginning of last season to make a full decision on that. The beginning of last season, you thought the Yankees were going to be in a rebuilding season. Nobody even knew if Aaron Judge was going to be a solid major league ball player last season. And they wound up taking baseball by storm. They completely blew past anybody's timeline of how long the baby bombers were going to take to be re- rebuilt because that's what they were billed as last season. They were the baby bombers who completely defied everyone's expectations. Now, if you want to look at this season as a step back, all right, fine. But I think you only think that way because they took it as such a massive step forward last season that, in my opinion, I don't think you can be overly surprised that they had a bit of a regression season this year because, by all accounts, they shouldn't have had the season that they had last year. Last year, like I said, that was a year nobody could have predicted them to have. So I think it was only natural that they took a small step back, but I think on the grand scheme of things, they're still going to be fine. They're still light years away of, uh, ahead of the timeline that anybody could have thought. And we're going to bring Dave Hastings on, but let me read Cousin David's comment here. Every year, Bill's on the other. In order for Aaron Boone to be successful, he had to do better than Girardi. And those aren't my words. Those are Aaron Boone's. He said World Series are bust, and by, my, and by his evaluation, he failed. Fine. Dave Hastings is here tonight. Dave, how you doing? Doing good, Mike. Doing good. How about yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. So... Dave, after you left last week, I had my cousin David on. We were talking a little Yankees, and that's kind of why we started off the way we are uh, we are right now. Do you have any thoughts on the end of the Yankees season? I mean, Boston was the better team. The Yankees are relying on the home run ball, and if they don't hit the home run ball, they tend to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I mean, all in all, I, I read your cousin's comments as well, and I mean, I get where you're coming from with that, because honestly, if that's what you throw out there, then that's the expectation you set for everybody else. So uh, I think it's one of those things that it's his first year, and it takes time. This isn't something that happens, you know, after just one year. Girardi, I, I mean, I'm not 100% positive on this, but I'm pretty sure Girardi didn't get him there in, their first, in his first year. So 
Um, you know, I think it's just one of those things that it's a patience game, but Yankees fans are spoiled and it's hard for them to be patient. I don't really think there's any other way to say it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, abso- abso- absolutely. I agree with you on that one. And, um, God, you said something and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty tired right now. So you said something that I had wanted to respond to early in what you were saying and I lost track of what it was. So that's my fault on that. But yeah, I mean, in my opinion, I don't look at this season as a bad season. And I feel like, you know, you kind of said it, Yankee fans get a little spoiled, especially after the massive year they had last season. And, you know, I, I guess you can bring up David's point, but what I was saying uh, when you had come on the other day was that, um, you know, at the beginning of last season, nobody even knew if the team was going to be 500. Nobody even knew if guys like Aaron Judge was going to be a solid major leaguer. And they blew the doors off of absolutely every expectation possible last season that anything short of a World Series was going to be a disappointment this year. And I, I get that's how Yankee fans have been raised to kind of look at it and stuff, but I don't really think that means that the season was an utter and complete disappointment. I still think that they are ahead of the of their timeline. It, if you're a Met fan, you wouldn't look at it that way. Well, you know, Dave, it's funny that you said that because after we went off the air last week, the way my cousin David wanted to talking about the Yankees, I called him the Met fan of Yankee fans. And I stand by that statement. Because if you ever heard him talk about the Yankees, you would think he was talking about the Mets. <laughs> <laughs> And I feel like if the if you know you had this young rock of talent and were able to you know get to wear uh, you know those colors and you get to you know kind of get to that point you're excited for it because you know that it's a growing process and you're like wow we really got something to look forward to I mean think about how Mets fans were when they had that amazing pitching staff and everybody was healthy and they pitched really well. You know, everybody's like, wow, they're really set well for the year. They got to get some more offense, and they could be some treble in the NL, and here we are now. So I just, you know, I think it's one of those things where you just kind of have a different perspective on base, on how baseball works or how sports in general work mm. when your team got 27 championships. Yeah, I just remembered what you said that I wanted to comment on, but you brought, you brought up the down note of where we are right now with the Mets. I just want to point out. That the Mets finished the year at seventy-seven and eighty-five. The Mets went six and twenty-one in the month of June. You take that month away, it would have been a much better season. That's all I'm going to say on that one. But uh, to bring up something you brought up earlier, you brought up that the Yankees are a team that kind of lives by the home run, dies by the home run. I can't remember what it was you said earlier in the year, but I remember you asked the question. Uh, about the home run, and I can't remember the exact question, but if you remember my answer to it, that's kind of what happened to the Yankees, where they have all these guys who can hit for power, but they don't have a lot of just true contact hitters who can get on and kind of play small ball. I know Eric's answer to that was, well, that's not the way the team is built, blah, blah, blah. But I, I think that's what's kind of missing from baseball right now, and I think that's what separates a lot of the top-tier teams is that the top the, the top teams, you want to throw the Dodgers in that, you can. But I think of the Astros, and I even think of the Red Sox to, the extent, to some extent. They're teams that can still perform and produce runs without the ball going out of the ballpark. They can still do things when the home run's not flying out. And I think that's what kind of separates them from the Yankees this year. So, any final thoughts before we move on? No, I think you, I think you summed it up well, my friend. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm just gonna read David's last comment here, and I uh, I guess it's funny for fans who don't like Aaron Boone. You mean you? This season really gives us ammunition to tell Cashman we told you so. Yeah, but I mean honestly, if you want to take that one thing against Cashman, I'm tired of people acting like Brian Cashman's not a good general manager or he's past his prime. Dude is probably the longest tenant tenure general manager in baseball right now. And I tell you right now, if he was if he was a free agent tomorrow, every team in baseball would not be able to move fast enough to try to pick him up as their general manager. There's not one. I, I got a lot of respect for Cashman 
And you cannot like the fact that he got rid of Girardi and brought in Aaron Boone. But if you don't like him for that, then you don't like him for Aaron Judge. You don't like him for Gary Sanchez. You don't like him for Masahiro Tanaki. You don't like him for Luis Severino. You don't like him for trading a role to Chapman for Glaber Torres and then re-signing Chapman in the offseason. So you have to take the good with the bad here is all I'm trying to say on that. All right, let's move on a little bit. Now, I tell you what, Dave, before we go to football, we got the NBA season starting tonight. You got the Sixers playing the Boston Celtics right now. And then you have the Golden State Warriors taking on the OKC Thunder at about 10 o'clock right now. It's halftime. The Celtics are up 47-42. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on basketball because I think if we were to do predictions, we would all pick the same team to win this year. So why don't you just tell me real quick, what are you looking forward to in this year's basketball season? I mean, I think seeing how the East plays out with, I think, Toronto upgrading from DeRozan to Kawhi Leonard, um, Boston, and if Kyrie and Hayward can stay healthy, what they can be, Philly with another year of that team together. Um, You know, I'm kind of interested to see how the East shakes out. I mean, it's the first time in – what what's it now 16 years that lebron james isn't in the eastern conference that sounds about right so i mean if you really think about that you know that really kind of opens it up and it's what a lot of teams in the east have been kind of patiently waiting for and having that opportunity because you know some nba owners even if they know they their team can't win it you still want to get there you still want that opportunity and nba owners want the money so i mean no matter how you look at it, I think some of these teams really could end up – I think the Eastern Conference playoffs are going to be more fun than they've been in a long time. I think that's one of the things I'm definitely looking forward to, especially when you get into the uh, second and third round before the finals. I think, you know, that could be a lot of fun. Um, in the Western Conference, I think I'm curious to see how Golden State integrates Boogie Cousins and what they're going to do with him. Um you know, OKC with another year of Westbrook and um, Paul George together should be kind of pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think that's something that that's kind of a, a group that could gel together and maybe play a little bit better. I, I don't have the highest of hopes for them that when it comes down to having a chance against Golden State, but I do think that they could be a pretty good team to watch. And whether or not does Russell Westbrook get a third season in a row of triple doubles because his team's basically, <laughs> you know, his teammates kind of get out of the way for rebounds and, you know, things along those lines. So I think that could be kind of interesting to see. Um, Houston with Melo and him, I think a lot of people actually think Melo is an underdog for sixth man of the year. Um, and I think especially the way Houston's set up and how they run their offense, I don't think that's a far-fetched uh, prediction for Mello. Um, and then lastly, just because I'm a Bulls fan, curious to see, you know, marketing, how he develops and in going into his second year. You know, what can you expect to see out of their, their rookie from Duke that they drafted and, you know, some of these young guys that they have. And Zach Levine, another year off of that knee injury. And, what you know, could he continue to excel his game? Because let's be honest, a lot of us were – really thought he was pretty damn good before he blew out his knee the way he did. So, you know, maybe he's somebody that develops. I, I, I think Chicago is good enough to maybe pull off, you know, the eight seed. Obviously, I think they're swept or maybe win a game in the first round and that's it. But still, maybe pull off an eight seed. Um, and the Knicks are going to suck again. And the Nets, I have no idea what to expect out of them. And where does Jimmy Butler go? That that's really I I don't know man the more I'm talking about things keep popping in my head I apologize. No that's okay that's okay. Uh, you, we can stick with the Butler thing for a minute because what did you think about him returning to the Timberwolves and having the practice where he basically called out everyone it was like challenging Carl Anthony Towns and coaches and stuff and all these different things coming out of that. What what did you think about that? I thought that was insane. I mean personally I thought it was all staged to get attention on how good he really is and what he's able to do and his competitive nature and his drive to win. I think I personally think it was staged. 
whether or not Minnesota helped staged it or him and his, you know, agent got to talking and came up with the idea, I don't know. But I think it, I think it was part of, uh, you know, what he, you know, what he's trying to do and what he's trying to get out of this situation. Uh, your cousin, I actually think, makes a really good point. Maybe the Timberwolves should reevaluate and keep Butler and maybe trade Towns or Wiggins. I mean, I love Towns. I, I think Wiggins is sadly somebody that's fallen short of what you expected out of him at this point of his career, but still a sol- you know, solid role player on teams. But I, I don't think uh, I, I don't think that's a bad idea at all because I I, I I think nobody would disagree with the fact that Butler is is somebody with the heart of a champion compared to what you hear about Wiggins and Towns. I mean, it's not a terrible idea keeping Butler and trading Towns or Wiggins, but the problem is, I think the way the way the NBA is, the way the NBA is right now, I just don't think it's feasible because right now, all the talk is Butler has no intention of resigning with the Timberwolves, and you know, a guy like Carl Anthony Towns and even Wiggins to an extent, they're both young enough, and they were both. I mean, Wiggins probably more so than Towns. They were both on the team when the Timberwolves were bad, and I do think you kind of get used to losing a little bit and being out for yourself and having that mentality. I think they're both young enough that they still have to turn a mental corner to become to have that winning persona like Butler has. Because uh, even though Butler, grand scheme of things, Butler's never won anything himself. But in terms of who has more heart and who has more of a work ethic, I don't think there's any question. Butler's got more of a work ethic and he's got more heart than either of them because you got two number one draft picks and then you got Butler who, like you said a couple of weeks ago, was the 30th pick in the first round. He had to do a lot more to establish himself than those two guys did when just by being the first overall pick, you come out with all this massive hype and this aura around you. And like you said, Wiggins has not even come close to living up to that. I think if anybody would get traded off of Minnesota – Wiggins would probably be the first one. The problem is he really hasn't developed into anything more of a, a, a mid to low range uh, uh, shooter. Really, I mean, he doesn't he doesn't really have that much of a shot to speak of. So I don't really know who would give up anything for him at this point. So there's that. And he says in the chat, Wiggins number one pick, max contract. And I never thought I would say this, but the Cavs five years later won that trade. I mean. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that one. I mean, I don't think Love really developed the way that the Cavaliers thought they would, thought that he would with all the questions about his, you know, uh, whether or not he's really into it. Dave, I guess you disagree with me on that one. But I, uh, I think he's. I think your cousin's completely correct, just simply for the fact that the Cavs ended up with a ring and Minnesota's, and you know, been an average team with above average talent for years. So I, I got to say, I think your cousin's right on that one because Cleveland got their ring and uh, Tim, Minnesota's struggling to break, have home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. Mm. Well, I, I can't disagree with you on the ring part, but I think we all know the year that they got the ring, it was Kyrie and LeBron who went off in the finals. It wasn't Love. I don't think Love ever really became that – dynamic superstar that everybody kind of hoped they would. But he's here, ladies and gentlemen. Eric Tressler has returned to the sports zone. Eric, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, but, I mean, are we, ta- are we really talking Kevin Love? We were very briefly. We, we didn't, like, spend an is hour it, on him. Did, is, it, is there something happening with Kevin Love, or are we just talking about how he's the best player on a shitty team again? Well, we – Okay. We weren't going there. We were talk- okay, let me ask you something. The Wiggins for Kevin Love trade, do you think there was a clear winner in that one? Which trade? The Andrew Wiggins for Kevin Love trade that happened after LeBron I mean, signed. I mean, I don't – yeah, no, I don't think there was a clear winner. I think it was kind of a wash. Kevin Love just went to a new team and – Minnesota picked up a younger player, you know. I I don't see it as a great move for either side, but it, uh, an okay move for both sides. And now Kevin Love is, you know, he's going to score more points. He's going to grab some more rebounds. 
probably going to have a pretty good season, and the Cavs are going to suck. <laughs> Colin Sexton, Rookie of the Year. Just like uh, Minnesota days. I'll average 20 and 10 again and win 25 games. Man. Hold on, wait. By the way, Mike, where, where did Colin Sexton go to college? Um, I, I, I mean, he got me. He got me. Go ahead. Where did he go to college? What do you mean? Come on. Why else did I ask that question? Okay. What is Alabama? I, I okay. I, it's always roll tide. Yeah. Always. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. And by the way, do you know who is the coach of Alabama is? In basketball, not not football. We all know who it is in football. Uh, no, I do not. I don't either. Avery Johnson. Oh, oh. no kidding. There you go. No Wonder kidding. why they're producing some talent. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, he wasn't much of a uh, pro coach, so at least he's having some success in, in the college ranks. So you got that. All right, I'll ask you real quick because I had asked Dave, and that's kind of where we got off on this on this Kevin Love talk. Here. What are you looking forward to in the NBA season starting tonight? Um, the finals to get here so we can see uh, the Celtics versus the Warriors, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, t- I'd tell you this. I'd tell you this. Eric, I'm sorry to cut you off. I'll let you keep going in a second. I want to see the Bucks or the 76ers or both of them. I want to see them both become the class of the NBA Eastern Conference. Because you look at those. Well, teams. then you're going to need a, another bad knee injury from Kyrie and another broken leg from Hayward to make that happen. I think it's on Giannis Antetokounmpo, the Greek freak. I think he needs to take the next no, step. They're too forward. deep, and they're, the Celtics are too deep. They're too deep even for Philly. Uh, you know, Philly's an up-and-coming team too, but they're just the the Celtics' depth, their length, they're, the, they're just too good right now, and the East is way too weak. Maybe Toronto can make a push at them. I don't know, but uh, I don't see much. Stopping I think, the Celtics if they stay healthy. It's all about the health, though. If they, if they, if yeah. they lose Kyrie and Hayward, then obviously it's a crapshoot. Yeah, I, I just like, cousin cousin David has been beating this drum since last season. Kyrie Irving and Gordon Hayward are not going to get traded before the trading deadline. That's not going to happen. You've been beating this drum since they were both hurt last season. It's not going to happen. Kyrie says he's resigning there. So I mean. Neither, neither of them are getting traded this year. I'm sorry. Let me say this one thing, Eric, and then I'll let you go. I don't disagree that Boston's got some serious depth and they have the experience on their side, but I think both Philly and Milwaukee have depth, and I think they have budding superstar talent that I look at the Celtics, and, yeah, they got a superstar in Kyrie Irvin. They don't have that second superstar, though, in my opinion. Hayward is good. Horford is good. I think between Antetokounmpo and Bledsoe and Middleton and the guys they have in Milwaukee, and then you look at Embiid and Simmons, and we'll see what happens with Coles. You got Sark and you got Covington. I think if they wind up taking that next step forward, I think they could match with the Celtics. So it's all about whether or not the young guys are going to wind up taking that massive step forward this year. Go ahead, Eric. No, I disagree. I think it's the Celtics to lose. Um, the bigger question to both of you guys, would either of you guys be brave enough if I said, I'm taking the Warriors, I'll give you the field. Who's taking the field? And who are you taking if you took the field? Because I can't see any team out there that's even challenging the Warriors, especially after they added Boogie Cousins. No, I would not take the field. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder if he's really going to be Boogie Cousins come the end of the season based on the injury. He could be 75% of Boogie Cousins I'm not gonna he's going to win a championship. I'm not going to say the field. I'm just saying I wonder what he's going to be. When you look at the rest of that team, it almost doesn't matter what Cousins does this season because you still have the four all-stars and you still have the role players on that team that have helped have won three in the last four championships. So, yeah, I can't take that. Unsung heroes like Iguodala and Sean Livingston and, you know, guys that you don't hear much of but play big roles, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. All right. So, I'd say let's make this, let's make this short and simple here. Week six of the NFL. 
let's say two minutes each. Quick thoughts. Dave, we'll start with you. I mean, Kansas City New England game was nuts. The Monday night game between San Francisco and Green Bay was entertaining. Um, completely shocked and confused about what the hell happened in Dallas and Jacksonville. No, me too. Um, I mean, that one just shocked the hell out of me. I was at a wedding, so I didn't get to watch any of the games. But, um, you know, the the offenses continue to thrive as these defensive players try to figure out the ways to be successful without getting penalties and fines and hurting themselves and so on and so forth or – you know, I mean, that's just a freaking – that's just freaking ridiculous at this point. I mean, the, the NFL is on a record pace for yards, touchdowns, points per game. But shout out to Baltimore gets 12 or 11 or 12 sacks in a game and continues to dominate the points per game. And, uh, I mean, just shout out to teams playing defense because it's just – it's absurd what's going on right now. Mm. Eric, what do you got? Baltimore it was 11 sacks, and that's the most since 2012 when Greg McElroy got sacked that many times in a game. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that was interesting. Um, Tom Brady's Tom Brady. Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers. You know, they just do their thing. Um, the rest of the league, I mean, that, that, to be honest, the Miami game to me was a bit crazy. Uh, coming down to them winning on that like last second field goal in overtime before we almost saw another tie ball game. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that there was, uh, and as far as the scoring goes and all the records go, I mean, they have taken into consideration all the rule changes. I mean, people don't even know how to hit the quarterback anymore. I think the other night, uh, I forget one of the linebackers might have been in the Kansas City New England game said that he didn't hit Brady on the play I think where he scored the touchdown because he was afraid it was going to be called the roughing the passer you know what I mean that like people don't know how to hit anymore so of course it's going to lead to more offense and then listen that's what the league wants they're trying to drive fantasy football trying to drive gambling they need something to energize the sport and I mean listen chicks dig the long ball it helped in baseball way back in the day coming out of the strike to up, you know, the home runs and up the run production. And I think you're seeing that here at the NFL. They're at, they've been down the last couple seasons in the ratings. They're, they're trying to gain back the fan base, and they think they're putting points on the board is going to do that because it's going to shock in all people. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I'm surprised you didn't say anything about the Giants. Yeah, I they suck right now. I mean, they – and I agree with what John Mara said. I, you, you know, I'm tired of Odell making headlines off the field. Make them on the field. Yeah. yeah. When was the last time he made a headline on the field for something for a great play he made? It was the Dallas one-handed catch. Yeah, that was a, that was a that's while. The last, yeah, that's the last time I can remember a positive like thing where everybody was like, oh, my God, Odell after a game. Shy of, like, whether it's him pissing on, you know, pretending he's a dog pissing on a goalpost or – you know, doing something stupid, you know. He, he just, that's the interview that they had no idea he was even doing with Little Wayne. And they, he just a lot of bad PR. And I agree with what Mara said. So, I mean, right now the Giants are in all sorts of turmoil. And it doesn't look to be a productive season. Although Saquon Barkley looks to be the real deal. And I'm glad we drafted him. Yeah. Do you think Eli plays the whole season, Eric? I hope he does. Listen, it's not Eli's fault we're losing. We put up 30 points uh, two weeks ago. We, you know, the, the offense is all right. I'm not. It's not the offense. The defense is right right now. They're giving up way too many points. They're not, you know, getting to the quarterback. They're not creating turnovers. They're not. They're not feared. You know. So I mean, the, the, I, I put it on the defense, not the offense. This isn't Eli's fault. He'll be well, the fall guy. He'll be the bad guy because he's the one that Odell wants out of town, it seems like. So, I mean, well, he'll probably get his wish sooner rather than later, but I think he should start the whole season. Well, let me ask you a question because I agree with you. I don't think – I wouldn't put this all on Eli. But given the struggles of the offensive line, do you think Eli is starting to get a form of uh, David Carr syndrome where he's so worried about getting hit that – He's getting nervous in the pocket, and that's why he's always making the short passes rather than trying to sling it. 
Yeah, I think that plays into it. I yeah. definitely think that plays into it. It's a mental game as well. And you know the line's collapsing on you. It's tough to stand strong, you know what I mean? But uh, I think that when push comes to shove, Eli's a guy you want in crunch time. He's a guy you want when the going gets tough. You know, he, he's got that even kill mentality that, that, you know, you need. And I don't put this on him. I really don't. I, I think it's a combination of things, and I just don't think team chemistry is there right now. And I'm not sure what Shermer's going to do to make it right, but I don't know, one in five. Well, I mean, even in a weak NFC East right now, it's it's not it's not good. Let me ask this question, and then we'll go on to pitch. What do you make of the rumors that the locker room is starting to turn on Eli Manning? Because there have been a lot of those over the last week. Listen, they can say whatever they want. You know, it's, again, a lot of Odell. It's a lot of, you know, him, you know, spoiling the apple cart. Again, this isn't on Eli. I, I'm sorry to say it's not. I, and I'm not trying to give Eli a pass. I'm not saying he's the best out there, but let me throw your question at you guys. Name one quarterback out there right now that's available that you would start over Eli Manning. Two-time Super Bowl champion Eli Manning. Yeah, but we know who you doing. Who's the guy you're bringing in? No, I'm just saying. Is it Kyle Luleta? I don't think it is. I mean, who's the guy? Who's the guy? Who's the free agent out there? You're not bringing in Kaepernick. No, and I, you bringing in? you're not bringing in anybody. I think Eli should start the rest of the season, but I just wanted to say, I think one, you definitely see him not as comfortable in the pocket as, as you would expect a veteran of his years to be. And it's because of that offensive line. It's not because for some reason he all of a sudden lost his nerve as a quarterback. Um, you know, and I think the other side of the thing is, you know, all the drama you're hearing, it's headline grabbing. It's it's New York media, and Eli Manning is still, you know, maybe not the money face of that franchise, but he's still the guy that diehard Giant fans are going to look at as that fa- the face of the franchise for now because they know everything he's done for them. Yeah, but, and I, I don't. He's the greatest quarterback the Giants have ever had, in my opinion. I think most people would agree with that, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. And I think the bottom line is, like you said, he, he is at a point where he he spent over two two full seasons, literally two full seasons of constantly getting beat up between the majority of 2016, all of last year, and then the start of this year. And if that's how it's going to be as a quarterback, what are you supposed to do? You want to be confident in your guys, but you got to keep in mind he's practicing with these guys and probably going to deal and probably deals with the exact same crap in practice. Mm. Is, I doubt this is just strictly on the field. So I think this is something that has steadily built up. And you put in, I, I, your cousin threw out him. You know, ended up in Jacksonville, and I think he, I do think he still has another year or two in him that he could be a, a very good quarterback. And I don't think New York's where it's going to, where his career is going to wrap up. Yeah. I will say this, though, and I'm, I'm not advocating that Elon mentioned this. I, I already said, you know, I agree with the fact there's no one better out there. You don't have anything behind him that can replace him. But, and I'm not saying they shouldn't have taken Saquon Barkley either. He was the best player in the draft. I agree with that. I think they should have done a better job to have a plan of secession in place because you knew that sooner or later. Eli's career was going to wind up coming to an end. And I think the fact that you have so little behind him right now speaks to the franchise's lack of preparation. But again, I think he should finish out the season. So, all right, we got a few minutes left here. Let's go to picks. And then, Eric, I got something else I want to talk to you about. So let's do picks right now. So me and Dave both went one and two last week. We had picks Philadelphia, Jacksonville, Kansas City. And we were stunned with Jacksonville, uh, defeat by the Dallas Cowboys. Good stunned, but still stunned just the same. And then Kansas City lost to New England. Eric picked the Giants to beat Philadelphia, and unfortunately is pulling three right now. He is 7-10-1 on the year. And me and Dave are deadlocked at 10-7-1 going into this week. So the three games we are to pick. First game, Dallas Cowboys going into Washington into what is – a very big NFC Eastern Division matchup. Uh, Dallas going into Washington to take on the Redskins. Dave, who you got? 
Uh, I mean, Dallas and Washington both coming off of big wins. Um, Washington, in their last 20 games, has alternated wins and losses. Um, so I'm hoping that trend continues and going to go with Dallas on the road in Washington. Okay, I'm sticking with my formula where I always pick against the Cowboys. So I'm going with Washington there. Eric, who you got? I'm going with the Cowboys. You're going with the Cowboys. All right. Now we got uh, the New York Giants going into Atlanta. And I believe this is – you guys check me on this. This is Monday night, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yep. Okay. Giants going into Atlanta to take on the Falcons. Eric, who you got? It's an ass-kicking waiting to happen, Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, I tend to agree with you on that one. I think Atlanta at 2-4 and four is looking to bust out in the big way. So I am also going with Atlanta. Dave, who you got? I mean, I think the Giants early will come out energized, Monday Night Football, all that fun stuff. But Atlanta is going to wear them down even with – Atlanta actually just put Devontae Freeman on IR, um, and they've actually been better without Freeman than with him so far this year, ironically enough. So I'm going to take Atlanta. Mm. All right. And the last game we are to pick, you got the New York Jets at 3-3, and welcoming the Minnesota Vikings into their stadium this week. Jets coming off a big win on Sunday, beating the Indianapolis Colts. And let's go back to Dave. Who do you got? Jets are – I'm sorry. The Jets are playing who? The Jets are playing the Vikings. Minnesota. Uh, I, I – oh, man, because Minnesota's not looked all too well on defense so far this year with injuries and what have you on their defensive line. The Jets are kind of a roller coaster. Who's home? The Jets. The Jets are home. I I I think the Vikings are going to be able to do enough to throw off uh, Darnold and cause him to have a rough game. So I'm going to take Minnesota on the road. Darnold's look good at times. He doesn't have a lot of wide receivers to play with this week. And Yudma is out for at least three to four weeks. Uh, I think the Vikings defense look at this as a get right game. So I'm going to go with the Vikings as well. Eric, who you got? Vikings. Vikings. All right. So there's your picks this week. <laughs> there's your picks this week. We all agree on Atlanta and Minnesota. We are somewhat divided on Dallas, Washington. So there you go. So, Dave, I'm going to let you out a little early here this week. Uh, I'd like to I was going to say, you don't have to because, I mean, there's, I'll be honest, well, there's not a whole lot of baseball to talk. Well, I want to hear so, your I mean, post. I would like to hear a little post-mortem from you on your New York Yankees. So. It is up to Dave. But I don't really have a postmortem. We had a nice season. We won 100 games. We went up against the best team in baseball, and we lost in four games. I'm not upset about the season. I think there's a lot to look forward to. I think the future is bright. I'm a happy camper. I just think baseball season is pretty much over for me. I mean, shy of, you know, obviously the, the series going on now. I think Boston was uh, won pretty big tonight. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. The Yankees, I'm, I'm happy with where they're at. I mean, again, you, you won 100 games. How, how disappointed can you really be? You won the wild card. You won the wild card game. You, you know, went up against a team that won 108 games. I can't, right. I can't be that upset. Let me ask you something, though, because last week we didn't have you on. I had my cousin David on. He looks at the season as kind of a step back from last season. Do you look at this season as a step back, even though you guys only made it to the division series? No, it's all growing pains. It's all growing pains. I agree. You guys are all going to learn from it. The, the, plus, the coaching staff and everybody else is going to learn which young talent they're going to want to roll with in the future, which ones they're going to use as trade bait and, and put on the trade block to try and bring in some pitchers. Yeah. Yeah, I think this year showed them a lot with a lot of people. And uh, – uh, as much as we didn't make it as far as last season, again, if you don't win the championship, well, what the hell does it matter if you lost in the first round or the last round? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. All that matters is the winner. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, I tell you what, seeing as how we're not really doing too much baseball now, we got about three and a half minutes left. Do you guys see Venom? Uh, I did not get the chance to, no. Eric? I have not either. All right. 
I'll say this. If you guys have seen all the bad reviews that movie has gotten, I will say this. It is not a great movie. I wouldn't even say it's a good movie. All the secondary characters are just there to get a paycheck. They didn't even bother trying to develop the secondary characters. But I'll tell you right now, the stuff between Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock and the Venom symbiote is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I went into that movie. I was in a pissed off mood. This has been a rough time for me the last few weeks trying to run the store that they gave me to run. And just everything, it's just, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it hasn't been fun. Let's just put it that way. I came out of this movie. I was smiling. I was laughing. There is some genuinely good comedic moments in his Venom movie between uh, Eddie Brock and the Venom City. And there's some really good action scenes in it, too. You guys are fans of comic book movies. I would recommend this movie to anybody who's a fan of comic book movies. Just don't expect the Dark Knight. Don't expect the Marvel movie. Expect just some good, dumb, fun action. Yeah, I intend to see it. I'll say that much. I just haven't had a chance to recently. I liked it. I liked it. I thought it was a good time. Eric, what do you say? Yeah, no, I'm interested to see it, too. I just haven't seen it. Um, something I probably will check out, though, uh, you know, when I get some time, too. But other than that, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen, since we're on it, the Aquaman trailer was pretty cool. I did check that out. It's like five minutes long. I don't yeah. want I, I didn't I didn't see that whole trailer and I'm probably not going to. It's like, dude, I'm I'm just ready for the movie already. Oh, uh, did you guys hear they delayed Flash the Flash movie for like the, the millionth time? You're supposed to start shooting in 2019 now, it's getting pushed back another year. Uh, I'll say this. Aquaman trailer, really good. The D w, the D C universe is a mess again. Ben Affleck's out. W, they came out and said they're probably not gonna make another Superman movie with Cavill. Um, so really all they got right now is Wonder Woman. They have that second one coming out in Aquaman. I really, I really don't know how they're going to pull this stuff out because it, it, it's their whole game plan is just falling apart piece by piece and brick by brick. And they really might need to scrap it all and start again outside of Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, I thought the first one was great and I can't wait to see the second one. Yeah, don't forget about Shazam, though. Shazam's coming out in March. I'm looking forward to that. All right, so that's going to do it for all of us here tonight. I thank everybody for listening. Let's do some final thoughts here. Ten seconds each. Dave Hastings, last words. Oh, God, I hope Dallas wins on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. Eric Tressler. Well, I'm sure you guys talked about it last week, but I didn't get to hear your thoughts on me. Ten to seconds, be... ten seconds. We're going to run out of time. Oh, I'm sorry, but I, I thought that fight was kind of crazy. Oh, yeah. Um, Khabib winning. So, yeah, that was my final thought. All right. Um, and yes, it was. We did talk about that. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. I am Mike Aguilar. We will see you all next week.